Good evening and welcome everybody to NYC Film Green Office Hours. My name is Shira Gans and I'm from the New York City Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. For those of you not familiar with our office, we're the agency and city government that supports all the creative sectors in New York. Those sectors account for 500,000 jobs and over $150 billion in economic activity. So in addition to that, we also permit all on location filming in New York City. So perhaps some of you have interacted with our office as well. Today at our office hours is part of our NYC Film Green program. This is a program that recognizes and gives resources to productions engaging in environmentally sound practices. So if you're not familiar with it, I can put a link in the chat. You can learn about the framework that we've established to help you green your sets and also some of the resources like today's office hours that can help you to get there. So without further ado, I'm excited for our discussion today about cleaner energy options for your sets. And I'm gonna hand it over to Jennifer from Earth Angel to introduce our experts for the day and to get the conversation started. Thanks everyone. Great, thank you so much, Cher, I appreciate it. And um, thank you to everybody for joining us for this really important discussion about uh, rethinking power for your sets. Um, I am joined today, uh, uh, sorry, I'm the Director of Services for Earth Angel, and I'm joined today um, by uh, Jenny Kane, uh, a member of the Electric Department and also a member of IATSE Local 52, and also um, Carrie Coombs, who is a producer of, from her, her company, Firedance Media, and um, also a former gaffer. So. Um, Carrie um, is very familiar with new technologies in um, clean energy. She actually physically helped to build uh, many of the portable electric bolt stack units that you may see on set and, um, you know, has done a lot of really pretty amazing innovative stuff with um, rethinking power for her own films and we'll be able to um, hear a little bit about that later. We also are joined by Taya Jeanette, who is the sustainability manager for Earth Angel. And I see we also have our founder <laughs> and leader, um, EOB, Emily O'Brien from Earth Angel with us as well. So thanks and, and welcome everyone. So um, yeah, Taya, do you wanna just bring up the <clears throat> your screen real quick? And we'll give a little bit more of a background about the New York City Film Green program for those of you that may be interested in um, learning more about that program. Um, it is a um, kind of a certification program. I mean, not completely officially, but it's um, it's actually just a, a, a tool that has been um, developed, updated to help um, productions that are shooting in New York City to um, um, you know, have some sort of a guideline um, in, in all the different areas that they might want to help reduce their impacts in filmmaking. So it addresses everything from zero waste to fuel reduction, um, energy use. So all the things that really make up the biggest um, impacts of film, which I'll show you a little bit about in, the, in a moment. Um, so if you want to go forward, Taya. Yeah, um, we have an agenda here. Um, so um, we will just, you know, kind of talk a little bit about the topic, not too much, because we want to really hear a lot from our speakers about their experiences. Um, and then followed by um, a Q&A with, with Carrie and Jenny. And um, that will probably end around six o'clock, maybe a little bit after six o'clock. And then that's when we will also open, up, open it up to office hours, which um, you can have, you know, bring any of your questions about sustainable production, doesn't have to be related to energy. And we have, I see a number of our amazing uh, Earth Angel staff here to try to answer any of those questions. So next slide. Um, yeah, so what is New York City Film Green Program? So Shira touched on this a bit. You know, it's a, it's, um, it's a really voluntary initiative that, um, you know, encourages all the productions to, to try to implement sustainable practices, again, in all the different departments and, and um, you know, dealing with, we deal with so many different kinds of waste and, and, and energy use um, from one department to another. So it really kind of goes through and, and, and tries to explain ways to reduce those impacts in, in a simple way. Um, so, you know, and, and really just focus, focusing on the main impacts of, of film production. Um, next slide. 
So um, again, the New York City Film Green Program is a um, is an offering through the mayor's office of media and entertainment. It's totally voluntary, but there's a lot of benefits to doing this. You know, it really kind of um, is a really useful tool to help um, establish um, green practices on your set. And as well, if you um, kind of meet certain program requirements, you can receive uh, NYC Film Green Seal, which you can use in your end credits. And really the timeline is pretty straightforward. So there's an, a simple application process, which you can find on the NYC Film Green website um, and which you, you know, will submit in prep. And then it will kind of help guide you through what the program requirements are for the different levels of, of certification. And that's obviously done all through production. And then at the end, um, we ask you to just submit, um, you know, your, your, um, form and um, it is reviewed. And then if you meet the qualifications, then um, you will receive your seal. Okay, so um, jumping into our topic for today. So we wanted to talk about power on set. So uh, I'm not sure um, if you guys have had the chance to see this um, report that was put out in 2021 uh, by the Sustainable Production Alliance, uh, which um, it work, works very closely with um, the Producers Guild Association Green Production Guide. And what they did, what they um, showed in that report is taking data over the last number of years using their PEAR tool, showing um, the average emissions, greenhouse gas emissions um, for different formats. And, and for this report, they did feature films as well as television um, series. So interestingly, you can see the data here. It's um, you know, it the film production, as as you know, most of us already know, has a, a huge impact, right, from a carbon um, impact perspective. And the data that the um, SPA report showed was that ten pool productions can have an average of three thousand three hundred and seventy metric tons, or thirty three metric tons per shooting day. Um, you know, large. Uh, large films um, had a carbon footprint of about 1,100 metric tons, and then medium, 769 metric tons, while small films had carbon footprints of about 391 metric tons. And um, this chart actually also shows kind of a breakdown. So what we're kind of mostly going to be focusing on a little bit more today is really that blue area, um, fuel. So um, uh there's all different uses of fuel, but if you look at any, you know, any profile of any carbon footprint for a production, fuel will always be the highest um, source of greenhouse gas emissions. And for, for that, so there's obviously there's fuel that's used for vehicle travel. Air travel is actually kind of calculated separately, but what we're focusing on today is the fuel used for powering sets, which we will see with fossil fuel powered um, generators. Um, here's another kind of breakdown from that report. Um, again, you can see 48% uh, or about half of the um, of the greenhouse gas emissions will come from fuel use. And then for television series, um, a little bit different, but still, you know, quite a high impact. But also the same thing that you'll see is is primarily fuel for. And we're mostly for scripted. Unscripted is a little bit different. You'll see a lot higher um, impacts from air travel, uh, a little bit less so for um, for fuel impacts. Um, so we can show that later. But um, so that's kind of a little bit of a breakdown um, of of you know the what we're looking at today, right? In terms of impacts of production, but primarily really focused on that fuel aspect. And we have today with us um, two amazing experts in the field of powering sets. We have Jenny Kane, as I as I mentioned before, and Carrie, and we were just going to kind of, you know, we have some questions prepared. Obviously, if you guys have any questions, please direct your questions um, to the Q&A section, and we will be um, addressing those at the end um, of, of the discussion here. Um, 
but yeah, so I just wanted to jump in with Carrie and, and Jenny, if you guys wanted to turn your cameras on, um, we can start in here. Thank you. Um, welcome. Um, so I, I just wanted to ask, you know, from your perspective, you guys are working every day on sets, powering films. How would you describe the current approach or mindset to powering a set? Let's just say for the purpose of this discussion, let's say, you know, maybe the bigger sort of productions, tent poles or TV series scripted. We might do it a little differently in Vancouver than New York. So Jenny, do you want to jump in there? Uh, sure. Um, New York, unfortunately, we're still very reliant on big generators. Um, and so that means the 1200 amp generators, 1000 amp generators um, that are on many of the trucks. Um, and they're part of the tractor trailer. They pull the, you know, the, the prop truck, the grip truck may have one, the electric truck generally you know, has one. Um, there'll be one in base camp. Um, then we also have van generators when we're doing for additional location work when you you know you you've kind of too far away. So that will also be a you know a diesel fueled thousand amp generator. Um, so we still unfortunately power a lot by by big generators. But we I think people are beginning to think a little bit more about how to do smaller things with you know alt, you know alternative methods. Um, so I'm also curious to sort of learn more about this because uh, we don't have it as much as I think you do on the West Coast. Yeah, I mean, here in, we do power a lot of stuff, especially with the blockbusters, Star Star Trek, I guess, when it was here, had 18 generators in one set right. uh, and just all around the ring of this big gravel pit. And uh, I don't know, maybe seven or eight of them were actually just powering background tents, heating and cooling. Um, uh, the way that I think of it, like what's the what's the purpose of that? What's the what's the aim of having all of these generators and then there's big long lines and these you know transformers and things that need to like keep the line signal strong is that uh, in that set we wanted to have 200 amps of power available, uh, you know, with it every 20 to 30 feet throughout the set and hidden too. So we're burying cable and everything, kind of dropping it down from the from the sides. Um, the idea being no matter where you want to go, no matter where you want to shoot, no matter what you want to play there, the power is right there waiting for you. And there are obviously advantages uh, to that, huge advantages to that in a world with uh, infinite capacity to avoid, absorb carbon in the atmosphere. But uh, what actually happened on the day when we start shooting, we're, we're maybe we're using 200 amps at a time. And at the same time, all 18 of these generators are, are running continually, just in case we move from over here to over there, right? So uh, the way that I describe that is like running your car all day in case you want to listen to the radio for a bit. <laughs> On top of having all of this juice, uh, we also had most of the set was lit with LEDs, which didn't require anywhere near the amount of amperage that we were putting out there. We had like tons of LEDs for the set and then, and then some lights and lifts that are the typical big guns. And the way that I that I see set lighting, the challenge in set lighting is uh, is going to be primarily to convince directors of photography uh, and directors like the creative team to uh, try fixtures that use a fraction of the energy, because still the go to is an eighteen thousand watt light for daylight and a, you know twelve thousand watt tungsten light for for nighttime street light stuff. You know, way far away in a big lift and. Um, I'm not gonna claim at this point that there's a straight replacement for that type of light in the LED world, but there are definitely other ways to shoot. There are other styles of cinematography that maybe don't require, uh, you know, light, bright light on every single square inch of the set. So um, one thing that I try to do when, you know, consulting with a production or, or coming out with my own productions is just make sure that right from the beginning to the end of the project, that's a consideration, like the, the finite ability to, to of the Earth's atmosphere to absorb carbon is a priority. So I'm going to make that a decision in choosing a director of photography. I'm going to make that, a, you know, even in choosing a project, I'm going to be picking projects where uh, I don't foresee a need for, for that huge draw. Uh, and then if we can eliminate some of the consumption needs that we're assuming we can start scaling down and using more electric power on set. Uh, anyway, that's, that's where we are and where I'd like to see us go. Yeah, for sure. And so 
Um, yeah, that's that's one of the things that we think about um, because a lot of these things they're all you know connected. And did not did not have to have a better word for that, but you know, so like when we're when we're considering green options, we think of it kind of like a package, right? So we um, we want to consider LEDs, but I mean, really, from a from a person that's like setting up power, like how much do you really? I mean, how much say do you really have in in kind of suggesting what you know to, to go with a green option or not? I mean, I, I what I you know what I think is the case is that's more kind of like the the decision make you know decision of the DP or or someone else. But um, how much how much influence does like you know electrician or gaffer have in that in that situation? The smaller the show is, the more say that you have. And, you know, I make that as a gaffer, I was, I would make that a priority in my conversations right from the moment they're asking me to come and do the job would be like, what (laughs) what was your DOP planning in terms of uh, their, you know, their lighting style? Um, Are you going to need a generator at all? Like the the first two features I did were small features, you know, small independent features, but we did not have... uh, gas or diesel generators at all. So we used a combination of house power. Actually, that's not true because this was before Portable Electric had their 2K and 5K units. So I did not have those, but what I had instead was like the, the gas version of those little Honda putt-putts, the 2K and the 5K or 6K uh, okay. version of that. Uh, but it, but if I did those projects again, I could do them with just, just a few volt stacks in the back of the truck, right? Um, yeah. And yeah. so having those, con- having the trust of the producers, having a, like a good relationship with the DOP and also having the kind of like personality where I'm willing to raise these things uh, and challenge. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of ego in the industry where it's like, my creative vision is like this. And the only way to achieve this is with these lights that consume thousands of watts of power, you know, every moment that they're burning. <laughs> Not having, having, being able to say like, yeah, we could do that or uh, we could do this. Um, that would eliminate all of the cable, it would eliminate the generator, it would eliminate all these expenses and all these, you know, crew costs, frankly, if you say, you say that in front of the producers, the producers will make that call. <laughs> I mean, like, oh, no cable, <laughs> no rigors, this is great. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I'm curious, Jenny, as an electrician, do you, um, do you have these conversations, um, you know, when you're, when you're kind of planning things out and, you know, how much is our green options really considered? Uh, I think we have some say in how where the generators are placed and how often you actually need a generator. So sometimes I'll disagree. I think sometimes you have to run more cable, which does require more people, um, which I have no problem with. As a union member, I think it's good to keep lots of people employed. Uh, sometimes it's better to use that big generator and run a lot more power and just use that rather than having a bunch of small 7,000 diesel gas ge- or, or um, electric gas generators, which we also put out a lot too. So it's, you can do a bit of both. Um, also more and more people are using LED and which is great. So I, I see that on sets a lot more, um, not as you said, for the big nights exteriors or, uh, so I think I don't see the generators going away just yet, but I, I see better use of, of things like bolt stack um, and, and that kind of thing. So you could power your base camp or you could power your video village. I mean, some of the times we're running our generator and it's just really powering video village because everything we have could just plug into the house because it's all LED. Um, but you have a, you know, a DIT, you've got video, you've got now you either you have heat or you've got air conditioning, you have units. I mean, so you are, the volt stacks are not able to do that yet mm-hmm. um so some of some of what we're powering with the generators is actually support for the production itself right yeah and i mean th- that's really an interesting thing that i kind of wanted to do a little bit of a comparison because this is one of the newer ideas in terms of approaching you know energy in a different way is really going from like um, the conventional way that we set up our grid to a more like redistributed part or redistributed way and using these um, bolt stacks possibly for these kind of, you know, um, areas that require smaller loads. So Carrie, I know you've talked about that a lot and thought about that a lot in terms of redistribution, redistrib- um, but I think that's something that it seems simple, but it's actually um, like, for example, you know, 
uh, a, a production might rent a, an EV, you know, for whatever, um, for someone or, you know, a picture car or something, but um, crew will see it being charged by a diesel generator. And usually people are like, wow, why would we do that if we're, you know, why would we get an EV just to charge it on this, you know, um, polluting generator? But actually think rethinking it is like you were saying, Carrie, oftentimes diesel generators just sit there all day running but are not really powering anything. So we might as well plug in and, and, and use that power in some way. But maybe you could expand a little bit more and you guys could maybe do, you know, talk a little bit about the benefits as you were saying, Jenny, of having more, you know, the, the bigger Jenny's there to power everything versus more of the distributed power um, that right. Carrie, that you talk about sometimes. Right. But I think it's sometimes, it, it, it is up to an electrician or the, the electric department to say, we're not gonna run all these generators unless they're actually doing something. So sometimes it does require, you have to run more cable so that you are not letting a, a thousand amp generator run you know, a, a monitor. Um, because that can happen. And so I think that's our responsibility to not let that happen. And so if it's a little more work for my department, I'm happy to do that because I hate seeing that happen. Um, but, you know, like you were saying, sometimes you just have these big shoots and they want power where they want the power when they want the power. And there's not much you can do about it. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah, there is a there is a like a maximum efficiency. But the, the thing about the diesel generators is they're not very efficient. So the maximum efficiency is when there's about a 70, 75 percent load on the generator of, of, of power being drawn. So a, a good Jenny operator will always sort of like aim to achieve that as, as a target and spread it out equally across the phases, uh, you know, in, in the power. Um, but you know, as Jenny says, sometimes like if you're doing an exterior day and the sun is doing all of the lighting and it's pleasant and you don't need to do much heating or cooling, you're you you're gonna end up overpowered. And sometimes it's just not possible to get your you know circus generator to power your set stuff. And I think that in situations like that, that's where even if your original plan is to use diesel generators, having a few of these volt stacks, or especially like now there's towable units coming out that are, you know. Mm -hmm. 20 kilowatt hours, or even I think they're aiming for a 200 kilowatt hour unit at portable electric. I'm not sure if they've achieved that yet, but there's 60 kilowatt. Hour. There's there's a whole bunch of other options that could roll in on a day where the needs are low uh, and mm -hmm. replace that outright. And if you if you're able to do that each day that you're able to do that up here is saving you hundreds of dollars in fuel costs, which would probably offset the cost of renting the unit if you got really skilled at using it when it's needed. So the beauty of the battery power is it's 100% efficient. It's power, it's, it's the exact amount of power that you need, where you need it, when you need it. Um, so when I've used it for a distributed power kind of power grid type of thing, I did use the 5K and the 2K units. And then like a contained uh, set where we would otherwise have had to have a, a generator out on the, uh, out on the a, like a block away, cable run through all downtown. But then when you get into the location, it's a very sensitive location. So they like, we want carpet down everywhere. There's cable going, but the cable has to go everywhere. Uh, in a situation like that, uh, the same riggers that put the cable and the generator in and on all and the same team that went in there could bring in power to have it where you need it and be powering your, your uh, LED fixtures, sky panels and things at the various points where the power points had been needed. So I have tried that in an exterior night shoot um, and managed to get through a whole exterior night shoot <laughs> with two van loads of, of volt stacks <laughs> and uh, nothing else for power. But this was a small sort of a sort of show, right? So <laughs> they're aiming for like a, a television look and the director's aim is to get into the MOW uh, circuit as a director after years of being a scripty and that was achieved. Uh, the look is good, but it's maybe it's maybe not what we're used to. So there's like there's darkness in it. <laughs> there's you know there's actual darkness that, where you can't see anything at all. There's not like just less detail over there. It's just like there's it's film noir, right? It's like recovering some of our uh, former styles is going to help us succeed using less power for lighting. Yeah. Yeah, that's so interesting. I think I actually visited you on that set when you were doing that. Yes, yes, you were there. We were looking for each other yeah. anyway. Yeah. <laughs> it was too dark. We couldn't see each other. Um, yeah, there was two sets. There was two <laughs> things shooting there on that same night. I think that's what happened. Yes. Well, so that's that that is interesting because in, with a lot of things with sustainable production, um, in, in all the different areas, um, all the different impact areas, um, 
what we find is we often will get a much better result and actually see real you know, decreases in our impact if we actually are planning more, right? So um, for waste, we're, you know, we, we think we do a lot of work, um, Earth Angel, with, um, you know, trying to choose zero waste for all of our productions, which involves a huge, um, you know, strategy for how we're going to do this, right? Especially if we've got a lot of locations and, you know, there's all the different streams and, you know, what do these vendors do? How much is this going to cost? Is this going to cost extra? So, but if we're able to kind of work it out with vendors and, you know, locations, and we've got all the days where we know we're going to have, you know, high background, it, it we actually can see like very high diversion rates. There's, there's a, a measurable impact there. But what about for power? What is, do you guys see any advantage really in thinking about power a little bit more that way? Like, um, you know, I think what you guys were both saying is that when you are kind of starting out planning things, like a lot of times what you, the job is to just have power and not lose power. So you're sort of over budgeting for power just in case. Um, but what is, you know, I, I know, you know, we've talked a little bit before about how can we change that way of thinking um, to maybe, you know, actually plan it out a bit more since we know what the loads we will need for all the different areas are. Is it, how possible is it to actually, you know, power for, for, for budget or budget for power? Sorry. Uh, budgeting for power. I actually have like a little, <laughs> I have slides that I can share. Oh, yeah. yeah sure. um, Let's see here, Let's see if this works. There we go. So, oh, it's kind of behind all these faces. The, so I, when I did plan for that exterior night shoot, um, obviously my biggest concern as the gaffer who had just spent two weeks convincing the producers and the DOP and everybody that we could achieve this <laughs> without renting a generator and laying cable the day before, um, I, I went through basically and talked to every single department head uh, about what they're running on their trucks, what they're running on the on the shoot, and I talked to special effects and lighting in particular, and the you know and the dit, and I and I put together a spreadsheet that had their like actual power uh, consumption needs, which is like the little silver sticker on the back of all their fixtures that says how many watts does this actually use, um, and I put that all into a spreadsheet. But not only that, I also added the additional. Um, factors of how long is this expected to run so if it's a toaster maybe it's 2000 watts or 1500 watts to toast a bunch of bread but it's not going to go all day long so we don't need to use that all day so uh, and also with the intensity we had a lot of sky panels on the show and as a gaffer i don't put them on full poop to start with i put them on around 70 percent and like and that gives some flexibility to get more light or less light. And if it's at 70% and they're like, we need a lot more light, I bring another one in also at 70% and still we can bring them both down, right? So the intensity uh, is also a factor. Mm -hmm. And if it's something a huge, the, the, the new uh, S, uh, F360s, the, the great big sky panels that almost can compete with an 18K, um, we've had them. I've, I've never met a director of photographer who can stand to have them at 100%. They're just so bright. So like, you know, those are maybe going to be at 2 or 3%. So if you take your, uh, uh, the formula here is you got the, the number you're going to get on the side of your volt stack, for example. And of course, unfortunately, every manufacturer labels their stuff a little bit differently. But what I like is a kilowatt hour. Like the total storage capacity of this unit is this. Uh, and then underneath that, on the, in the top bar here is the is the total amount of energy that my production is going to use all day long, uh, and then and then that's or, or yeah that's the yeah that's how long your volt stack is going to last. So if you're putting one one thousand watt sky panel onto one five k volt stack, it will last you um, five hours. I, I hope that makes sense. So you, anyway, you add the other things in there, and my little spreadsheet that I made spits out the. Uh, spat out the number of volt stacks, the number of kilowatt hours I was going to need to acquire. And we managed that with a combination of 5Ks and 2Ks. Uh, now, of course, at this point, the 20K towables were not invented yet. They were in development. They were invented. They just, we were working on the prototype. So we didn't have any. Um, and this was only a half day. So it did take us two van, van loads, but the projections that I came up with were pretty accurate. 
And then again, this is a really small show. <laughs> so, but you can either like, you could scale that up now that there's bigger power packs available. And you can also take just some part of your little show, like your splinter unit or your second unit or something that's, you know, they want to shoot something over there. It's just too far uh, from where your generators are. And you can, you can still kind of make a little plan within your bigger plan uh, using these formulas. And then oh, hang on a second. Yeah. So the, uh, this is the case study, the victim. This is the um, look that we, we ended up with for the interior exterior. We basically, these are uh, practicals. We're outside in a park, but e each of these is a 500 watt uh, street lamp with a 5K volt stack at the bottom. Uh, there they are in the background there. And then we had a little balloon over here and a couple of sky panels here and there. Um, yeah, and uh, the beauty of a bolt stack is you can charge a bolt stack off a bolt stack. So when it came to the balloon, the balloon was an HMI, uh, and you don't want to turn it off to repatch and then turn it on again because they take time to to cool off before they can respark. But uh, we we were able to just park another unit next to the unit that was getting low and just tie tie them together, daisy chain them together, and keep it going all night, no problem. Uh, and that's what we powered: video, village, sound, set, lighting, special effects the lamp posts, craft services, and a bunch of little stuff all around. On this show, we didn't have much of a circus. We had one, um, we did have what, like one or two of these, uh, you know, combination AD trailer makeup hair uh, type units. Um, in my discussions with transport at the start, we just got them to arrange ones that had their generators on board. And then, and then they ran those and that was a completely separate consideration. So we didn't need to worry about that. But if we had, uh, and we had a towable unit, that would have been just fine. And then, uh, yeah, because we used these volt stacks uh, for the whole production, Portable Electric uh, gave us a report afterwards based on our consumption from those, those units and uh, what we would otherwise have used out of diesel and gas. And that amounted to just in one weekend, 94 kilograms of carbon uh, emission reductions, which is, or 40 liters of fuel, which is like, you know, it's more, it's, you know, still feels good considering what we would have been doing otherwise. So, uh, yeah, that's basically. Yeah, that's so interesting. I'm wondering, um, Jenny, do you have any thoughts about, you know, really the practicality and the reality of trying to, you know, think about power this way, uh, you know, obviously on, on much bigger pr productions? I mean, what do you see any, um, you know, do you think that would be doable? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, right now, the, the other problem is they're just not, the availability isn't up there mm -hmm. either. And then the price. So those two things are an issue, at least in New York. And I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, whether they're just more available on the West Coast than they are in New York. Um, but I, I think I see them right now being really useful for something, just like you said, for a small second unit, for you're doing a little splinter unit, you're running down the block, and rather than taking a 7,000 gas generator down the block and pushing that, you would take one of these and do the same thing, quieter, the neighborhoods would like it. Um, it's just, it's better in so many different ways. Um, uh, for out, for exteriors, yeah, I could see these being extremely useful. Um, but I just don't think they're as available yet, and I could be wrong. But um, I, and I know some productions, you know, we we they are being used by some productions, and they have they'll have a couple of them on the truck. Um, so maybe that's growing, and I hope it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I don't think it's um, exclusive to New York City in terms of availability. I do I do hear that they are somewhat you know difficult to get in in some places. Um, the nice thing is now that they have different capacities, right? So Carrie was mentioning, um, they, they, portable electric, they, they kind of started out with the, these two Ks, but we're not really seeing those anymore. And I actually don't think that they continued. I don't think the, they're manufacturing the two Ks anymore. I think that's what Mark told me. Um, so typically the five Ks, which is what you showed in your slide. Carrie, and th those are those may be the ones, Jenny, that you've worked with in the past. Those are the ones I've kind of seen mostly. Um, and um, you know, in terms of cost, it will vary. They're competitive from market to market. Um, but I do like I wonder, Carrie, if you have any, you know, insight in terms of cost um, in regard to the rental versus, you know, the fuel savings, the savings on labor for cabling, that kind of thing, if you have any 
you know, experience or information like that to share? Yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, in my capacity as gaffer, I wasn't worried too much, worrying too much about budget stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so, um, and also because I was uh, working at Portable Electric and kind of gathering data for them, uh, all of these units were, were at my disposal <laughs> for this little experiment. So, I mean, I have done a, a, a pitch to consult with the MOW on how to, to see if we could reduce their number of diesel generators by one uh, by bringing in electric power solutions. Um, but unfortunately, well, I mean, what the, the deal that I worked out is that we could replace one for one, one of their diesel generators, you know, plus fuel costs uh, with uh, uh, one of the towable portable electric generators or the bigger ones from MBS, which I think are the 60 kilowatt hour ones uh, for without any additional cost. The only issue was that um, that the they 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 were unwilling to consider reducing their consumption, and so because they had you know anomaly stuff going on like the the catering truck running the AC in the oven at the same time kind of thing going on, <laughs> like they're just like no thought put into efficiency because all of their equipment had evolved in an era of just infinite fossil fuel power availability. And if you need more, you just get more. Um, we weren't able to go forward with that, but if you were able to pair a reduction in consumption uh, with the phasing out of one of the diesel generators in your overall picture, uh, you wouldn't be spending any more money is I suppose what, <laughs> what I'm trying to say. <laughs> but you might, I don't know, it's hard to do a correct direct cost comparison because then if you're going from like 18,000 watt lights down to, to LEDs, um, the LED version costs more, right? So to rent. Right. And that, so much that, depends too on the fluctuating cost of diesel. The picture that I gave them uh, was months and months ago, maybe even a year ago. Um, and I'm sure that now the same picture would have resulted in significant cost savings because the, their fuel costs are double what they were. So it would have saved them money if they could have done it, but they wouldn't, they weren't willing to change their 2K location heaters for propane heaters even. So, <laughs> so there just wasn't any way we could make it work. Uh, we would have needed three basically of the towable units to replace their one generator and then yeah. Mm, right. yeah some of those things are just not legal in new york city also you can't oh. put a propane heater i don't don't think any longer um oh really yeah mm. um i think you can correct me but uh, but I'm, i thought oh, that I was can. a fire de <laughs> a fire department uh, ruling oh, really? um mm -hmm. That's, we do yeah. use them a lot here mm -hmm. yeah yeah i mean some of those costs and again not just related to you know generators but also to all kinds of other things and and um where you know it looks like it's it i mean it is technically more to rent an electric vehicle but you look at the cost savings on gas and you're actually saving money so these are the types of things with these technologies that um, I don't think are always being considered by the decision makers. They just kind of see the price and they are like, uh, uh, no, that's, you know, we could get, you know, the, the regular old diesel generator for way less. So, um, these, again, these are these sort of mindset, uh, changes that, that we are trying to encourage right in, in the beginning when we're, when we're thinking about how are we going to put this all together? So, um, you know, I don't know, I think a lot of times we don't always have the luxury to take that time to, to really think through. But I think, you know, again, like anything else, if we are really um, piloting these, these programs in ways that are very doable and we can see these cost savings, we can see the greenhouse gas emissions avoided, um, you know, these things are very, very um, compelling to decision makers. And, and um, you know, I think, yeah, we got to talk to our, so our partner in New York City is Shattered Prism. Um, we invited um, their, their um, you know, their CEO to, to participate in this, but he's actually on set. He does stunts on the side, which I thought was fun. Um, so he was, he's on set today, but um, yeah, Shattered Prism is our partner for rentals of um, e-generators in New York City for the film industry. I'm not sure if there are any other vendors, Jenny, do you know of that um, are renting electric generators? Um, I don't know. Um, there are a couple of smaller companies that were starting up, but I don't know how far along they've really 
you know, I've, mm -hmm. I've, I've seen a couple of demonstrations of things, but Shatter mm -hmm. Prism is the one I know best too. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to say one thing though, that one, one of the great things about working with Earth Angel when I've been on shows that have Earth Angel is that you, you get a breakdown, I think it's every month or two months, depending how long the job is, of how much fuel you've used, um, where, where it's all been used. Um, and I think that makes people really sort of more aware and think about it. So then you think, okay, well, maybe we could do better next month if we didn't let that generator run all day long powering the monitor. Um, so I think um, some of it, we also have to just build more awareness about what, what we're actually doing and, and how wasteful most much of what we do. You know, the same way, I know it's a different discussion, but the same way when you see the vans just idling for hours and hours and hours. I don't know if that happens in California, but it happens in New York and it's just maddening, you know, but. Um, it definitely does not happen in Vancouver. <laughs> just kidding it happens a lot in Vancouver but um, yeah <laughs> um, but um, yeah no that that that's a um, really great point Jenny and um, yeah we'll have to you know talk to to Shattered Prism they need to get some more units out there for us but um, but also I've, I've also talked to some production companies that have expressed interest in purchasing them so that they can actually have them available for for their productions that they're working with so that's you know another thing um, to consider so we'll have to call Mark at Portable Electric and get them <laughs> on that. <laughs> Um, what about tie-ins in New York? So I'm not sure how much um, that occurs. Um, again, you know, with all this electrification, we also really want to consider what our grid makeup is. And I know that there is a portion of the New York grid that's still, you know, powered by coal. So it's not as, you know, you know, like in some places where, you know, we're 195%, you know, hydropower, which is renewable. Um, but it, you know, it is basically for sure um, a lot better from a carbon standpoint to be tying in. So Jenny, do you have any experience with, with that on, on any of your production? Yeah, um, I mean, we, we tend not to do a lot of tie-ins mainly because um, they are kind of dangerous. Um, in big buildings, you, skyscrapers you always have the building tie-in um uh it depends what the power situation is sometimes you've got tie-ins that are crazy and you wouldn't want to tie into them because it'd just be too dangerous and you don't know what that power is um hospitals you generally um it, it, often you'll run a you'll run a generator because you don't want to do anything to mess up someone else's system um it really depends but we you know tie-ins are used often um, um but depending on the situation but you don't, you can't really you you wouldn't want to be encouraging say no generators only tie-ins because that just that doesn't work for the business because a, a house doesn't have enough power that you're going to be able to do the lights I mean, you can plug in your LEDs but you can't do everything with that so even mm -hmm. if you tie into a house or a building nearby um, I think what I've heard sort of talk about more is having electric drops places and maybe that's a California thing too but actually having um, the way you would have a box on a sit on a sound stage, being able to have that in other places that you could tie into and run cable from there. But I, or have the company drop a power, you know, drop a box places. But I don't know whether that's even a possibility yet. Yeah, they are doing that in Vancouver. So what they are, the city is creating film friendly, uh, you know, drops. But we, I think we call them tie-ins. It's not like a building tie-in, but it's like designed for our seaway three-phase uh, cam lock system that we power with. Um, there are, the challenges around that are that, you know, as Jenny says, you can't rely on that completely because what if you want to film somewhere where there isn't one, right? Um, the, when it comes to choosing a location, uh, whether or not there's a tie-in right there is going to be at pretty much the bottom of anybody's list of priorities. But in Vancouver, we do have a bunch of locations that we use again and again and again and again, like Riverview, the old mental hospital, that's getting a few of those. And then there's all these circus locations that we use over and over and over again from one show to the next. So we can uh, potentially by 2030, Vancouver wants to get rid of diesel generators altogether, including food trucks, film, everything. That's super ambitious. Uh, their main method of trying to do this is by adding these uh, access points all around the city. Um, challenging to raise awareness and then adoption. And then I think in some cases there was like a 
some incompatibility, like they were using the wrong type of Seaway connector for the type that you get out of the rental house or something like that. But I think those kinks will be ironed out uh, and hopefully soon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I know it's, it's, it's a great program and it's been really supported uh, by everyone here. Um, the one way that they are identifying these spots are actually with an app. Like a, it's called like a map app, I think. And when you are doing your scouting and the locations will put in there, um, you know, where they're going to be shooting, how many generators, where they are, and it goes on this map. So it builds like this, this like map of hotspots um, of the, you know, where power is being, you know, really it, more power is needed. So based on these hotspots on these maps, then they um, will, will, you know, make the decisions about building these kiosks for power for the film industry. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. So, um, you know, that's something, and they're also starting to do that in Toronto as well, um, based on that, you know, kind of uh, looking at that program and, and how successful it's been. So, um, you know, so again, if you're always thinking back to what your impacts are, these types of fuel reduction impacts I mean, even more so than anything that we'll see with like the waste management work that we do, these will, you know, we can show, you know, from those charts that from the SPA report that we showed in the beginning, um, significant reductions in fuel use and therefore carbon impact. Um, and I think in general, I, I, I tend to see productions focusing a bit more on those just because of that real, you know, identifying that um, those types of reductions and impacts. Um, so we we have a few more minutes and I just wanted to touch really uh, uh, briefly on um, kind of this whole mindset and thinking about this because again, any you know area of sustainable production requires awareness, like you were saying, Jenny, and education. And um, I've had some conversations, I think Carrie, you were there with you know, other gaffers and electricians. And one of the things that um, I learned is that they, like when you are getting licensed, um, that you are not, they, there's not really any discussion about this type of you know, thinking this way with green options. And um, wondering, Jenny, if you know in New York, is that, you know, is that some, you know, something that they are talking about in either the, you know, the training programs or at the union? Um, well, more and more, each local is having its own green committee, um, and which is great. So there's a lot more awareness just in general about how people would like to see more productions work with Earth Angel or, you know, have sustainable practices. Um, I know from Local 52 that the head of our department, Rocco Palmieri, who I tried to get to come speak here, um, um, is, you know, very concerned about this. And so he does take it seriously. You know, can he influence absolutely every gaffer or DP? No, but um, it's on his awareness. Um, you know, we, we did have a panel um, just for the for Local 52's Green Committee on batteries and um, and green, greener power, cleaner power. Um, but it's it's a it's small. I think it's growing. But I think um, you know the more you know the more everyone pays attention you know to this um, with the green you know with the green production guide. I mean, a lot of people aren't even aware there is such a thing as a green production guide. So I'm always telling people, oh, have you seen this? And they don't even know about it. And I think that's sort of the, one of the first steps people should look to. But. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, no, I think I've seen a lot of green committees popping up at local as well as like national and even international um, levels, which is super cool. And again, I mean, for us from, you know, our small little Earth Angel, you know, work that we do, um, it literally feels like production to production. Like that's how we kind of, you know, are trying to push the needle and, and make a difference. Um, and, you know, the more you, 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 you keep saying the same thing, I think the more people will, you know, get the message and start, um, start making these kinds of changes. But I think there's so much that could come out of these green, green committees. Um, you know, these are all the people that are on the ground doing all the work and, you know, we all care. It's just like, you know, what about, you know, we don't always have the decision-making power. So, um, I was just going to turn to 
to any questions, but wanted to see if you guys wanted to add anything else before I go to a uh, brief Q&A. And we have a few questions here in, in, um, in the Q&A section. And um, yeah, if you if anybody out there has any questions, um, please feel free to to um, put those in the Q and A. Um, but just on that note of you know kind of decision making, we have a question from someone saying, you know, have you ever told a DP that he or she needs to like differently because of the environmental impact? It, you know, may be too high for what they want. Um, seems like real change in set lighting plans and therefore the power required needs to come from them because most decisions are made to serve the director or DP asks. Uh, yes, I have, this is the short answer, but that, that's not my framing. Like how have you considered the environmental impact of your creative vision is not how I would have that conversation. Um, so the, uh, to use, there's a couple of examples, but the one that I'll use is the same one from this example from the night shoot. Like I was there as a department head on the location survey. I'd already spoken to the producers. I'd already spoken to the DOP about just the topic in general of trying to use, trying to avoid the use of gas and diesel if we could get away with it. Because this is, you know, again, small, right? We're not talking about a blockbuster. This is a little uh, favor I did for a friend. <laughs> so, um, but that, but that, uh, that conversation was basically. Uh, providing an alternative that would achieve the same effect that the DOP was aiming for, but with lower consumption. Uh, and so in this case, he's like, let's put a lift over here. And in that lift, we'll put a 4K, like, you know, this was never gonna become a huge show with 18Ks and multiple lifts, but that was his original plan. Uh, and, you know, uh, that would have involved, we'd have to bring in a generator, we'd have to get a, you know, get a crew of rigorous to lay cable in the day before and all of that stuff would have had to happen. So he's like, but let's put that over there and a balloon over there. And my alternative that I suggested was how about we have a balloon instead of the lift in the 4K, uh, you know, and then in the balloon, we'll have like a hybrid thing that we can plug into two of these volt stacks. And then there's no generator, there's no cable, there's no nothing, but you're getting essentially uh, the same kind of wash that you were looking for from this 4K. Uh, mm -hmm. And in that situation, he's like, yeah, that, uh, that, that is a better idea, right? I'm, get, I'm still getting what I want uh, in terms of a look, but we can eliminate all of this extra uh, spending that you won't see on the screen when we go to show this, the, the film, right? So that's how I frame it. It's like, not only this will get you this, a similar look, but it's a different fixture. <laughs> it's a whole different way of, of lighting it, but it's the same type of light, right? And that's, and in my mind, that's a bit of, the gaffer's role and that's what I'm bringing to the table uh, anyway as a gaffer is that I, I know my fixtures uh, you know pretty much inside and out and then I know the most about the most efficient fixtures because that's where my interest goes and and uh, you know and I and I can tell people fairly accurately what's going to match uh, the tungsten and HMI fixtures that I'm that I'm going to be asking them to reduce their use of so that we can reduce our energy consumption basically um, but yeah definitely would never frame it by going like you know you're not thinking of the environment enough sh shame on you like that's not really how I do it it is still critically important that the DOP is happy with the look and that, and that everybody who's on the creative team is achieving the vision that that they're setting out to achieve uh, but just with less consumption mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a conversation that should more and more happen from the very beginning. So with the gap or in pre-production. So every get every department involved. And I know, you know, again, with Earth Angel, when you work with you know with the production, you do start with them in pre-production, but that's mm -hmm. the time for the DP and the gaffer and the the look of the film to be discussed. And then you can sort of think, okay, we could do the, all of this with LEDs. We could, you know, this this is how we can, you know, this is what you're gonna have on the truck. This is how we can arrange this. But that's the time to have the conversation. Yeah. yeah yeah and yeah. i have been lucky too on the in the features that i've been the gaffer of they were like road shows boat shows like really like out in the middle of the wilderness like we were never going to have a generator out there so that was a consideration right from the start in who they chose for a director of photography you know and that person might come with two arm loads full of their own personal led fixtures that we would just use for everything right mm -hmm. yeah um yeah, maybe that's that's a future office hours, like, you know, with uh, the DPs and all these like, you know, lighting options that are less intensive. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and to your point, um, you know, Jenny is, uh, it, the earlier that we are able to kind of get signed on with the, um, a production, obviously it's way better because what we try to do again 
and not just with energy, but we try to have a strategy in place. And our, you know, the way that we approach it is obviously we would never tell anybody how to do their jobs, but what we try to say is, you know, here are some options, here is the cost. And, you know, and this is, you know, this is how we, you know, we can help coordinate the, this strategy. And so we do have this strategy for, for energy um, and energy use. You know, we're always talking about, you know, trying to promote um, electric generators and even cleaner fuels. Because, I mean, you know, that's another thing to consider in terms of strategy for reducing um, impact is, and we see this way more in LA because it's more readily available there. Even in Vancouver, we don't have a lot of renewable diesel options. Um, and, you know, so for for anybody else that might be not totally familiar, so renewable diesel is a biodiesel, but it's actually refined even further so that when it burns in the generator, it's actually cleaner. It's like up to 70% cleaner. Um, so if there's that option, but in New York, I've looked into this a lot. We don't really have that option um, at, the, at the moment. I know the city has done some cool stuff with renewable diesel um, for fleets, but again, you know, with such a, with, with such a, a presence and an economic impact in the city, you know, this is something that could possibly be, uh, you know, um, a, an option for, for mm -hmm. film production in, in New York. I so, can see solar panels on truck roofs as well as being something yeah. that might be really effective, and particularly because every every truck in you know in New York has a small generator or we're running power to that truck so they can have lights and they can do everything. But if each one of those trucks had a couple, you know, could provide their own minimal amount of power, that would be a huge um, oh, yeah. bonus, I think. That would be huge. And that's a great point too, Jenny, because we actually work with a bunch of productions, again, not really in New York, but like say in Atlanta, where all like they're all the trailers are solar powered. So it's just again, it's just this thing with like technology and availability catching up with like mm -hmm. all these things that we keep like we talk all about them, but then like we call up and like there's nothing available. So that's kind of a a bummer. Um, but, um, yeah, so let's see, I have a, a, a couple more questions here. Um, how do you coordinate and plan the swapping out for volt stacks on low, lower power load days? And what are the logistical considerations, for example, to pause your rental of a diesel Jenny for a day or two per week and only rent volt stacks for a day or two per week? I would say that uh, it probably wouldn't pan out that way that we're like, we're going to only use volt stacks this day so we don't need the diesel generator. Your savings would be in the fuel that you would otherwise be putting into the diesel generator, which you're probably renting weekly anyway uh, on a longer show. So uh, turning it off for a day does save you a substantial amount of money, um, you know, depending on what you're using for your electric power solution. Uh, but when it comes to the planning, that's a that's the survey thing. That's the survey and production meeting thing before you actually show up there to for for your shooting day. You uh, you look at the the big the big picture and uh, what what parts of that picture you could phase out and put onto electric power. So you know the the target might be to to put enough stuff on electric power to take a whole generator out of the out of the equation. For example, you might be able to power your circus with one of the 20k towable units. I know people who have done it and done it successfully uh, and it lasted a lot longer than they thought that it would like several days as opposed to like one day and then charge it every night at the studio. Um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. And of course with the weather, probably in New York as well, <laughs> Vancouver is probably even a little more predictable, but you just never know whether you're going to need that heating and cooling. So you probably don't want to leave production without the option of diesel power you just want to provide them with the option of not turning it on for a day or for the portion for a portion of the day mm -hmm. yeah um yeah that's that's a good point and also you know kind of reminds me because we you know we've worked with productions in all different regions and again these electric solutions and you know e-generators electric vehicles may not be um, as viable in places with extreme weather, like mm. maybe not New York in the dead of winter, right? So, um, so that's another consideration um, that we have to make. Um, another question: um, Can Volt Stacks replace onboard truck or camper Jennies? Yeah, completely. 
Um, mm -hmm. the, on, the only issue then is the charging up of it. <laughs> when, when are you going to do that? Because you're not going to have a fuel tucker, truck running around that can just keep pouring stuff in there. So um, I think when it comes to PMP trailers, I don't know if you call them the same in New York, but where you're like filming out the back of something and you're filming into a car on a trailer, there's always a diesel generator on that truck. Those could be straight out replaced because that's hardly ever a whole day. That's that's usually like an hour or two in a day. So once that trailer is come and gone, they can worry about charging up their battery packs. I was also thinking like each work truck, like I know what's inside the bolt stack, right? It's not very complicated. It's a bunch of batteries. <laughs> I don't want to like divulge too much, uh, you know, information. <laughs> but, you know, and then it's yeah. like a, a couple other little tricks that, like, there's no reason that you couldn't have a bunch of those batteries and some of those little tricks on each work truck so that they uh, they can be self sufficient in terms of power. And then, as Jenny says, solar panels on the top, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then they don't need to be plugged in at all, uh, even in the winter. I just need to keep the solar panel panels clean. I, I feel like I straight off the question so i'm going to yes, say yeah. no i think that the answer is yes <laughs> yeah. yes uh, uh, they're expensive because i've talked to some you know, people who who own trailers or boxes um not the not the trail not the truck the trailer that drives the tractor but they own the box um but it, they at this point are still very expensive to replace just your 2000 watt generator that you might have in the back of your truck the prop truck or your 3000 or your even a 7000 you might pull off your truck the grip truck for instance if you want tools um and to replace that with the volt stacks is at this point really expensive and they won't do you know it just it wouldn't be worth their while to do it um yeah. so maybe if, if it comes down in price maybe they, people would be willing to do that because i think people are interested in doing it but they they're too expensive at this point yeah and you can't even use the argument of the lifetime fuel cost savings because <laughs> it's production that's paying for that so the <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, that which budget it's coming from is a, is a challenge as well well that's always a a major consideration and you know obviously from like a producer standpoint like that they really have to worry about that right they're always like looking over the budget making sure we're on track and for things like this are not normally written into a budget initially so these are all kind of things you know <laughs> afterthoughts unfortunately so again starting to think differently and building these costs in so that when it comes time to make the green option, we're not, you know, done. We've already thought about it. We've already put that cost in there. We've included that cost. We've included considerations for any cost savings in terms of fuel or labor. And, you know, it's just easier to do everything if you're really thinking ahead. So, um, and I think we have time for one more question. Um, and that is, um, uh, um, will there ever be a practical solution around utilizing new car charging stations to charge set trucks? So I know we have that. Um, I know we are doing that in Vancouver, but Jenny, is there any, do you have you heard any rumors I, about that at all? I haven't. Um, you know, and again, it, it's always supply chain. Um, there aren't even enough electric vehicles to to, for most productions at this point. Um, I haven't heard about them powering the trucks. The trucks always go back to the stage for mm -hmm. that, you know, so unless the stage is doing that or, you know, I think getting getting the, the studios and the stages involved is also a, a, an important element to this. Um, so maybe, you know, Steiner stages, for instance, had their charging that could charge the batteries as well as the vehicles, that would be, that would be huge. Yeah. That's that's a really good point, Jenny, and thanks for bringing that up because studios and, you know, what's happening in terms of energy use there is also really important. And I don't know, again, in New York City, um, because of the demand of production, and I know there's a lot happening there, um, people will kind of come up with these studios um, that literally do not have house power. So they're running them off of generators, like just like for the, you know, for the office or anything that goes on, you know, and, and for the stage. Um, so again, studios really can play a huge part in, um, you know, reduction in terms of, you know, energy use um, by, by, you know, improving um, efficiencies. Again, it comes down to a cause, right? Like, who's going to pay for this? You know, it's, it's, you know, they're the property owners, but really the production's the one really taking advantage of this. So is there a way that we can work together to, create an infrastructure that will benefit everybody and does, you know, not 
the, the cost doesn't all fall on one, you know, production or one studio or one, you know, uh, you know, one entity. So, um, yeah, I think, um, but I do know that in Vancouver, there has been um, some discussion and working with the utilities companies also on, on um, film, the film industry having access to these new fast charging um, stations. And, um, you know, with it, not just the access to the chargers, but access to parking, which is a really big commodity as well. And then, um, you know, being able to like park in a parking lot where they have chargers and that's all included. I mean, there's a lot of advantages to thinking about that. So, you know, excellent question and maybe something to think about for the future, but um, we are a little bit over the time. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I just want to add like, you know, in the, the phrasing of the question, will there ever be, and I, and I would, I'd like to like the pace uh, at which the EV technology is evolving and solutions are coming online um, is, is really rapid. So yes, there definitely will be at some point. <laughs> uh, and, I've, and I've spoken to people that I, and more stuff I can't talk about, but there's, you know, there are new EV charging solutions coming on board uh, in the not too distant future where any kind of building manager, like a studio, for example, could contract out with another firm that comes in and installs like a whole bank that can charge your whole deal uh, every single night back at the studio. Um, those might be a couple years away to see them really start to spread around, but we're not always going to be just looking for a gas station with like an EV port or like a grocery store to like sneak in there. Like it doesn't have to be that way. We can, uh, if we're all on the same page, at least jurisdictionally, uh, and, and kind of embracing the same solutions, we can work together to, to make sure that we have an integrated system that's as flawless and seamless as the one that we have now that just happens to be destroying uh, the atmosphere. So. <laughs> um yes and um on that on that note <laughs> no i just i did want to say um you know we, we are a little bit over the time um we want we kind of wanted to open it up now for our office hours where we can ask any kinds of sustainable production questions to we have a number of of Earth Angel staff here. I see a couple of our, our vendor partners here um, on stage plating, hi Edward. Um, and um, so I just wanted to you know wrap up and say thank you so much for joining us. I think it was, I learned so much and um, you know, lots of really great um, ideas uh, that you that you both brought up. And um, you know, again, I think so much of, of all of these ideas and implementation of the, these ideas again are just rethinking how we are doing things mm -hmm. so um and not just with power but again you know the, this this would really make a huge difference um in terms of carbon impact so um you know i i uh you know we'll keep we'll keep working on this so thank you so much you're absolutely welcome to stay um for the remaining um time um but uh i just wanted to say thank you so much and uh, uh, Taya, okay. if you want to bring up that one slide, um, I did put a, a few resources on here um, for anybody that wants to check out some more information. We have um, Shattered Prism, as, as we mentioned, as an Earth Angel partner, renting e-generators in New York City, Portable Electric, who actually has, you know, built the Volt stacks and um, are now, you know, they, they, so they're basically a manufacturer selling the units to, you know, places, businesses like Shattered Prism. Um, and they're like all over the place. Like, you know, it's kind of like you, 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 there's like portable, like Volt stack sightings out there and like in you know, social media, I think um, they were, they were um, showing this the last James Bond movie where they actually had the Volt stack in the shot yes. and Daniel Craig was sitting on it <laughs> and they were really proud of that. So um, yeah, the, the portable electric is, is, is a great option out there. And, and as Carrie mentioned, are now building different, um, you know, di uh, units with different capacities that can do a lot more. They've also built, um, they have an app, a, like a smart app, so it can be controlled completely remotely. Um, so that's that's another pretty interesting thing, um, as well as um, I encourage everyone to check out the Green Production Guide, and and Albert, which is kind of uh, the sustainable production initiative um, out of BAFTA. But they in both of those two websites have really interesting and useful case studies on not just energy use, but also you know um, waste management and and you know. Tra transportation, all kinds of things in there. So um, those are always good guides to, to check out as well. 
All right. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. So um, at this point now, I'd love to open it up to anyone else. Um, again, I don't, um, Taya, I just want to, uh, I think the questions, you can put questions in the Q&A, but we're actually open to anything that you had or wanted to um, ask or discuss or comment on um, uh, related to sustainable production. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're opening it up to anybody now. Um, I do want to, I did want to mention before other people drop off that <clears throat> um, the next office hours will be September 14th um, from 5 to 7 p.m. Eastern time um, on the Zoom format. And um, there will be, you know, a, a similar registration link that will be sent out by MOM. Um, and uh, that one will be producers roundtable. And we will be uh, having a, a panel uh, of, of producers um, that work in New York City um, to be talking about the kind of decision making that they consider when they're trying to, you know, um, green their sets and kind of the challenges of, of you know, what that, you know, how that really works, because it's, you know, from a, it's always a challenge um, budget wise, and you really want to make the biggest impact possible. So really kind of trying to look at what the costs are, but also how, you know, you know, what kind of carbon impact would that decision have? So these are the kinds of things that we wanna um, kind of explore a bit more with some local New York City producers um, at the next um, office hour. So that's, yeah, September 14th. Um, Taya, did we have, so are there any other questions that I may have missed? Um, do, do, do. We yeah, have... we actually, we have one from our very own ALG um, oh, up in the okay. chat. Okay, sorry. Which was, um, when speaking to other crew, electrics, DOPs, et cetera, to try to utilize more efficient alternatives, do you find people have a general understanding of why it's significant for carbon impacts? Good question. Does anybody want to um, respond? I, I would say, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Jenny. Yeah, I would say people do have an understanding, but not everyone. Um, so I think more awareness needs to come out. Um, and, and the more it's talked about, the more people pay attention. One of the things I find that this is something people focus on because it's so obvious that every set that doesn't recycle bottles and cans, and it's just, it seems like that's like the basic first step of recycling. And, and I know that's not necessarily the most, the one that's most important to producers or the most cost uh, effective or efficient, but that's what crew members see is like, this production is not even bothering to to recycle cans and water bottles and why do they have water bottles and and COVID has been a bit of a disaster for that so while people are aware and people really do want to do the right thing often it's so frustrating because you don't have the ability and it's comes down often from is there money is are the producers behind it or not um, and are they going to um, provide you know, Earth Angel on the set or not. And that's sort of, that seems the basic, either it's there or it isn't. And if it isn't, it's basically, there's nothing, um, no recycling is done, no waste reduction at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, it, it definitely does. You know, it does, it, it, it is always a cost consideration, honestly. Like, it, you know, people can have the best intentions, but, you know, if they, if they don't have the money to do it, they can't, which is why I really think, you know, for a lot of, um, you know, productions that are maybe a bit smaller budget, um, the New York City Film Green program is excellent because it really provides a guideline, literally department by department, and with practical things that they can implement. And um, and so, you know, and it's 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 more of a kind of doing it yourself type of thing, but you know, you you can follow that. There's um, you know, you you come to the office hours, you ask all kinds of questions if they, you know, want to have um, you know, more information about what waste management services are doing green stuff in New York City, like the, this is a perfect place to come um and and ask or you know, ask us here. So um yeah, so tell all your friends. <laughs> uh, I would I would add that um, I don't 
see a lot of merit in talking to, you know, individual crew members or individual teams within your production about like, you know, why it's important to, to reduce your consumption and, and do your bit for the environment because really the culture is set at the top. Those, those, that tone is set at the top. It needs to be the producers that are on board and all of the department heads that they bring onto the project need to be on board within each of those departments. Like I really do believe that people feel and understand in general that this is a pressing need we need to, to we need to do more and we need to do more faster but when you make it people's like individual responsibility that's when all those sort of like petty grievances are gonna start to mount up like why do i have to go find a special garbage for my bottle when all of this uh, all of this entire set is just going in the dumpster after the show right <laughs> like there's the people like you know the 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 hypocrisies within the the internal inconsistencies of like not doing it as a holistic whole project thing uh, will start to uh, cause people stress and there's enough stress in the industry already. Um, but when you do set that tone at the top, it's part of the reason I decided to try producing <laughs> uh, and make it a team thing that we're all gonna do this and we're all gonna do it together and we're gonna measure our successes. It's something people can feel active and proud and happy and uh, excited about. And then when you get measurable results at the end of the process, um, they know what it is that they've all achieved together. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's a lot more than just like, oh yeah, I spent four extra hours looking for the right garbage can for this like thing I had in my hand, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I do think that that, um, you know, it, it very much is kind of a top-down like approach in terms of like results and decisions. Um, but what we're also seeing a lot more is um, a lot more of a directive from the studios. Um, you know, saying like, we want to be where, like, we want all of our shows to be, um, you know, doing some, having some sort of a sustainability strategy. Um, you know, they may even provide some funding in some situations um, to, to achieve some of those goals. But I think in general, across the board, you know, at, at least any of the bigger studios, members of the, you know, Sustainable Production Alliance, um, they all employ some form of a sustainability initiative for their productions, which, you know, sometimes is, is more welcome on, on some productions than others. But again, if you have a producer that, uh, you know, a production manager that is really behind it, then, you know, they can really, you know, kind of carry out that directive a lot more um, smoothly. So, but it does require buy-in, I think, and it does require everybody to participate at every level, I, I believe. So, um, you know, I've seen a lot of times where, you know, we'll have crew members that just are really passionate and, you know, they'll just start, you know, I mean, kind of not, it's not even, this is not part of their job, but they're like, you know, while looking over the recycling and they're like trying to help find like where they can, you know, um, bring their materials for reuse and all kinds of things. Like we see a lot across the board, like, you know, people really wanting to, um, to make a difference and that, you know, I think it has to, that, like you're saying, Carrie, I mean, it's not like this or that. It's like, we got to all do something right now. Like it's, it's, you know, this is a, uh, this is a big deal. You know, I was just looking at the, um, the predictions, um, about, you know, this kind of heat, uh, you know, heat belt that's going to, we're going to see, you know, in a couple decades from now where, you know, we're going to be seeing temperatures over 125 degrees. I was just in New York last week and I was, it was so hot. I, I, I couldn't even breathe practically. Um, but yeah, so this is like the new normal, you know, I mean, everywhere we're seeing these extreme weather events and, you know, it takes, it's going to take all of us everywhere to, to be trying to, you know, do, do think differently and, and act lift differently. Jenny. Yeah, I think that's very true, very scary. Um, but I think it still comes down to, you know, the studios, they all say they have a green program and the reality is they don't, you know, mm. so, or it, it doesn't function. So they get to say it and maybe they do one little bit and then they get some kind of green, they get to say they were part of something. Yeah. But when it actually comes down to what happens on film sets or TV sets, um, mm. 
it's not there. And so I think they need to be held accountable a whole lot more. You know, mm -hmm. so Disney needs to be told that, you know, people know, need to know that Disney, for example, is not really as green as they, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, they, they are. I just have one, one final thought on that and something I always try to bring up in every one of these things, but I forgot to do that today is that part of the reason I think that we have those are like, greenwashing where we're not really doing anything we're just looking what that that's the low hand that's the easiest thing to do and in our industry people are tired like a 12 hour minimum day here i don't know if it's the same in new york uh, but i've worked multiple weeks that were like in excess of 80 hours and i've gone for months on five hours of sleep so people are tired and i think uh, when it comes to energy consumption <laughs> we need to think about the human energy too that we're consuming we need to again, from the top down set a culture where we are, we are allowing people to have enough rest to be able to actually uh, conceive of solutions and implement them. And, you know, <laughs> I, and it's, I don't think, I don't see that, I don't see that being feasible if, if we continue with these uh, days, so, you know, longer schedules, shorter work days. And in, or, and in order to get the most out of battery power also, we need to have shorter work days because it's not an infinite amount where we can just top up the generator when we run out. We need to plan so that we really are going home after like 10, maybe 11 hours. Uh, and, you know, every day, not just something went off the rails because nobody's had enough sleep for six months. Uh, so now we're going to work a 20 hour day for the second time this week. It just like we need to change that culture. Um, mm -hmm. And that's uh, that's another reason I became uh, get went into production. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, no, I love that. That is so great, Carrie. It's so true. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're kind of like, the, you know, the old stacks, we need to be recharged fully. <laughs> Otherwise, we're not going to work very well. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, and that is not that again, that is everybody, right? That's everybody working on the film set. Yeah, we, you know, we from, you know, we have such a dedicated force of eco PAs that we work with. And, you know, they're tired too. Like they, they are out there just like, you know, warriors, um, and doing the ground on the work. So we are super, you know, lucky to have all these, um, wonderful young people who are, you know, let's face it. These, these are the filmmakers and the crew members of the future. So, um, you know, I think we'll, we're seeing a lot more, um, uh, you know, people that are working with us, PAs and stuff that are signing on because literally they just want to do something good for the planet. Um, so it's, it's pretty cool. Um, yeah. So, um, do we have any other questions? We've got a whole, we've got some, some experts in the room here. So I, you know, would love to, to take advantage of, of their expertise and their knowledge. Um, if not, all right. Um, I just wanted to remind- I actually you. have a question oh. for you guys. Yes. Yeah, if, of course. Uh, which, whoever from your organization. So you said that, uh, that when you come into production, you do a report of where all the energy is going. Is that, uh, is that something you could talk more about? Like what is the, the biggest draw? Because here's something that I haven't really been able to figure out in my own experiments. <laughs> Well, so it's not as, um, it's probably, I don't know if I, that may have been the wrong way that I said it. Um, we're not actually doing, you know, looking at the actual like loads, right? Of, of like where it goes, like that's, that's kind of their sort of realm, but we work with, um, you know, every department and, you know, the, the riggers and, and, and the, like, you know, everybody to, um, to 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 discuss that and and put it out there to make sure that you know they should be thinking about this right like we're always like you know with um with the tools that we're using we will be looking at you know um we're, we're asking all the questions like you know uh, you know how much led how many you know what percentage of your lighting packages leds etc cetera, etc cetera. so that kind of um you know we're, we're kind of asking those questions and providing some resources you know we provide a list of um you know all of the applications that are possible with electric generators and to consider what the loads are there's that report that you may have seen out of the uk with this really great information i think portable electric was a part of that study um but yeah so we're not doing the actual planning that's that's where you come in to carry <laughs> we need you for that uh eub did you have a question 
You know, I just wanted to chime into that. And first of all, Carrie and Jenny, thank you so much for all of this delightful discussion. Always a pleasure to see you, Jenny. Um, and you know, all of our guests here who joined us and, and asked questions has been really fantastic. But just to kind of piggyback onto what Jen was saying there, Carrie, yeah, the level of granularity in terms of like power load distribution, we're definitely not at that level. We aim to get to that level um, and that would be incredible. But when we like complete these reports for production at the end, we're looking at what we're, you know, getting all the kilowatt hour readings from all the electricity bills and whatnot. So we're able to kind of at least map out and say, okay, this facility used more power than this facility and that type of thing. Um, and then also with the fuel breakdowns, try to look at, okay, we use this percentage of diesel, this percentage of gasoline, this percentage of propane, and of that, what vehicles were responsible for using the most fuel? Was it Jenny's? Was it the trucks? Was it, you know, pass vans? Whatever it was, you know? So those types of analyses are more in our wheelhouse, but we're, we're trying to, to kind of dig in deeper and you've given us a lot to think about on that front today, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Um, yeah, I don't think, yeah, I think we're going to continue this discussion with, uh, you know, talking about all the possibilities here and um, ways to rethink power. Um, but if there were no other questions, we're, we are ending a bit early, but, um, oh, thanks, Taya. There are some resources in the chat. Um, and another reminder that this, um, discussion has all been um, recorded and will be posted on the MOMS NYC Film Green webpage. Um, I want to thank uh, MOM and Shira for hosting us today. And we are really looking forward to um, producers roundtable for next month, September 14th. So thanks again for everybody that, that attended and a special thanks to Carrie and um, to Jenny for joining us today. Thanks. All right. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye. See you next month.